Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If it wasn't for the resurrection of the dead, Paul the Apostle said, I'd be of all people, of all men, most miserable. But we know that Jesus rose from the dead and has overcome our final enemy, which is death. And we have now the victory because of the price that was paid. So much was done. I think that's why we can spend our entire life however long gives us in this natural body, assuming that he doesn't bring the change which we're looking for, for these bodies to be transformed from the corruptible state that they're in into incorruption. But regardless of the, the natural lifespan that we have, we can use all of that to study scripture and the mysteries of God and to listen to good uh, preaching and teaching and exhortation. And we can sing all the songs of the grace and the mercy this morning we sang Amazing Grace. We sang a lot concerning the grace of the Lord. And, you know, we, w we can spend all of our time in that and we wouldn't even get to the very beginning, hardly, of what there is yet to be explored, what there is yet to know and to understand in Christ. And we've come a long way in, uh, I, I believe, we've come a long way as a people in 2,000 years. We know that there was a falling away and there was a time of great darkness and there was a time when uh, people really had little understanding of the grace of God. We know that the uh, Reformation came in the day of Martin Luther and there was an explosion of knowledge and understanding concerning the riches of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would never want to do anything to diminish that work of grace because it is by grace that we are what we are. If we have any understanding of the glory of the Lord, it's because He's given us that understanding. Praise the Lord. And we recognize that any authority that's been given unto us has been given to us by grace. And if we have any uh, ability to rule over our situations and to overcome, we've received that by grace. So that we can be as the King Nebuchadnezzar, without having to go through what he went through, who was very exalted as the king over what we would consider all the known earth of that time. And yet when it came time for God to humble him, and there's the, the scripture is in a well-known saying. A lot of well-known sayings actually come out of the scripture. Pride cometh before the fall. Yeah. Well, pride came and then came the fall yeah. for, for Nebuchadnezzar until the day that he was thoroughly humbled. And then God restored to him, raised him back up so that he could be a testimony, a witness of not only the authority of God, and we would say in this day, the authority of Christ Jesus, who is King of Kings, King over all Kings, Lord of all Lords, praise God. And he's doing the same thing with the people today so that uh, as much as he gives us of understanding and knowledge, and I've, I've rehearsed recently, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, a lack of true, truly knowing God, truly knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, truly knowing him and the love that he has for us. And because of that, that's that's why people remain in a position of the curse. Because we know that it's been taken out of the covenant of the law. And it's and we've received now the covenant of grace through faith. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. So that if we have anything to boast of, we're going to boast in the Lord. And none of us are outside of that position where if we have anything, if we've been given anything, how can we take pride other than uh, a thankfulness of what God has done. Praise the Lord. And, you know, I was thinking about the fact how God has done this through the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that is done is done through him. We see all of the types and the shadows of it in the old covenant. And yet, when, when God looked for a mediator, when he looked for an intercessor in that old covenant, he couldn't find one. That's what uh, Ezekiel said. I'm just going to reference this real quick, but Ezekiel 22, 30 says, so, so I sought, this is God, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me and on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own head, says the Lord. And he becomes his own intercessor. And by the way, and we know this, all of that was seen. <laughs> all of that indignation, all of that wrath is what came upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that all that we had coming, the Lord Jesus received. All of the curse was poured out upon Jesus. So that, that scripture over in 2 Corinthians that we read this morning over, and I think it's the fifth chapter down at the end, that says, He made him to be sin. Praise God. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord. That great exchange has taken place so that no man can boast. And yet, you know, we see great examples of the Lord in the old covenant. Moses was the mediator of that covenant. And I've just referenced this scripture as well over in Numbers 12, 3. It says, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Well, that's, that's what God seeks out for a mediator it always has to be a humble a humble person because god uses the humble things to bring down the proud that's his choosing god always he always takes those that are lowly and lifts them up praise the lord hallelujah so that's why he took jesus who was in his day considered no one and gave him a name above every other name that at the name of jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess praise the lord and and our strength is perfected, or, or his, his strength is perfected in our weakness. And we are learning that when we are relying on the, the, the Holy Spirit, see, that we're, we're, still in this, we're still in this change. You know, it's been 2,000 years that that old covenant was done away with. And we saw uh, kind of the, the, what, what should have been the final judgment upon that people that held to that covenant in 70 AD. And yet, for all of that, there's still a mixture today. There still is a mixture today that those two covenants are still trying to be held together. And Paul, and this is really where I want to go real quick tonight, over in Galatians, Paul the Apostle, I love this book because Paul was had become, I believe Paul was somewhat prideful and arrogant as uh, Saul of Tarsus. I, I believe and I, I don't, I, I think it was ignorance. I don't think he, I don't think anybody that, that is prideful or arrogant intends to be that way. I think it just comes as, a, a, because of their position, because of the gifts that they received. Paul really didn't choose a lot of the things that he was just born into. Yeah. It was just, again, it was the grace of God. And when, when Paul came to the knowledge of all that had been done on his behalf, he said, I am what I am because of the grace of God. He says, I do more. I, there, was, there was a real zeal that worked in Paul the apostle. And there's nothing wrong with zeal. The problem was, in his beginnings, it was zeal with no knowledge. He, he wrote really about himself in Galatians because he could identify fully with that zeal of that old religious system according to the Israelites who were trying to be made righteous and in right standing with God based on the external standards of the law of Moses. And so every time people would come preaching the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the mercy that has been poured out, shown through that grace, shown through the blood of the Lamb, by where we're made overcomer, they would come right behind and they would say, yep, we received that, amen. But, but here's everything now that you need to also measure up to according to this external code, this external standard of that first mediation. The, 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 first, the, the first way of mediating between God and man was through that law of Moses. There was no other way, praise God. But thank the Lord that he takes away the first, that he might establish the second, that we might be built upon the promises of God. Nothing else. That's, that's the working of the Spirit. So really, the, the first law, which was the external law of commandments and, and everything, all the washings and everything that there was in that religious system, was replaced by the higher law, which it talks about over in Romans, the 8th chapter, which is the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that Romans 8, 1, when it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Well, you can't get in Christ except the Lord bursts you into Him. You can't have the knowledge and the understanding of the riches that are in Christ except they're revealed unto you, except God removes the veil. You can't even come unto Christ. You can't even call Jesus Lord except by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So that once you do so, if you're found in Christ, you will not boast in what you have, but you will turn and say, blessed be unto the living God who has opened my eyes and brought me by his grace into his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's why I'm, I'm excited about what the Lord's doing. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. And when the presence of the Lord comes in by his holy fire, he can 
consumes everything that would stand in opposition of our, rel- our relationship, our fellowship that comes that, through him purely by love, purely by a love relationship of family is really what it is. Hallelujah. And what we find out is a lot of the things that we're holding on to very desperately holding on to because we believe it's God's order, God begins to consume everything that is a type and a shadow and a form and a format that doesn't line up with this love relationship that only works by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And we find that there's no rule book for it. It it works as the spirit. And what does he say? And that that seems so out of order. That seems so out of men's control. Why? Because it is out of control. And And the further that we go, the more that we we find his divine order working and the order of man being swept away so that he says he said those that are born of the spirit jesus told nicodemus are as the wind yeah. praise god we're, we're we're progressing in this walk of the lord we're progressing it we have we're 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 just really beginning to walk in it in a real living way and those that boast in and we can boast in what we have in comparison to ages and generations past. And yet I'm telling you right now, as we begin to have our eyes open up to understand what the promises are, what the riches are. You know, we talked about it this morning. We, what we know very well is all the laws of nature, the laws of physics. We were out at Mission Beach yesterday. We talked about going out on the water. And what happens if you go out on the water and you step out of the boat, you sink right into the water. It's just a law right? The law of the Lord Jesus supersedes that law. Praise God. Now you can't teach that by doctrine. You can only reveal, you can only walk in that by the power of the spirit. Praise God. It's just like what what you receive a report from the doctor about your health concerning the condition of your body. We talked about it this morning. Perhaps you have an ancestry of, uh, you know, cancer in your, in your heritage or all these curses that come. And we know they come through the lineage of Adam, of the fallen man, all of those things. And that is very real and very true on the plane of these natural laws. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a real, it's, it's reality. And yet Jesus is able to work outside of all of those natural laws by the law that supersedes all of them, which is the law of the Spirit. Praise God. And how does it work? He said, my word is spirit and my word is life. So that we, we lay hands on people and we say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. We're not speaking our own words, but we're speaking the, by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that supersedes the laws of the flesh. Hallelujah. I'm going to get to the scripture, but that's why Paul says, he says, having begun in the spirit, you, begot, you, you, you began your walk by this, you could not call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit. So having begun this walk into the new covenant by the Spirit, and you were able to say that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah, that He is the promised one, that He is the resurrected Lord and Savior, if you begot, if you began there, are you going to now be made perfected or come into maturity by going back to the ordinances of the old law? Yes, we had we work in that, we work in that according to the flesh. And this is the, the this is what I always see, I see in it. It's a, it's a, it is a growth. You don't you don't just jump from the old covenant that was that the flesh is under and begin to walk fully into the new covenant of the spirit. How do we know that? Because a newborn baby that comes out of the womb into this natural life, we don't immediately teach them everything in regard to the ways of the spirit. Oh, we do. We do. But what do we have to do? We have to also teach the principles of the laws of this life. You're not going to lie to me, child. <laughs> and if you do, guess what? There's a curse for it. There's a blessing. If you, and that's all according to that old law. And what are you training them for? To work in a society that's built upon those laws. So that if you go out here and you're in need of money and you go out and rob the store, there's a law that's in order that we abide by and we walk in according to that law. Praise God. Well, Jesus, did he come to take away that law? No, he came to fulfill it. And he did fulfill it. But he didn't fulfill it by the outward commandment, but by an inner law that was incapable of sin. It was the nature of God whereby he heard the voice of my mind and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he walked according to that nature, that identity of God that was within him, and he fulfilled all of the external laws. 
Hallelujah. And you know what? He didn't have to do it like how anybody had ever done it before. And he didn't do it. They, they called him a lawbreaker. And yet, as far as God was concerned, he walked in perfect obedience. Praise God. Now, that's where I begin to see how we are still transitioning out of that law of really what it is, is sin and death, into the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Which is why, that's why we get excited about these things. Because the Lord begins to reveal to us the work that has yet to be done. Praise God. Now, we have to balance it. And that's, I, the Lord keeps bringing me to this place of balance. He says, you know, uh, the Lord loves a just balance. It's his delight. He doesn't like when the scales have been played with. So, we stay in this place of perfect balance. I, I, I was listening to our brother, uh, Lynn Hiles, some of his teaching that he's doing on Romans, I like that. He says, it's, it, you're looking at the subjective and the objective side of the gospel. Yeah. Well, I like that because both, see, that's balance. There, there's a side where we count it as completely finished in Christ yeah. and we see the working of that has given us grace to walk today according to the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And there's nothing that we can add from it, and there's nothing that we can take away from it. And so then people that become unbalanced, they say, well, but if I, if I have to believe that, if I have to actually receive it and then believe it, that becomes a work. Do you see the twisting of the mind? How you take things out of balance? Well, that becomes a work, right? No, it doesn't become a work. It becomes, it is, it looks as though it's something that you have to do. But who does it through you? The Spirit of the Lord. And you yield your members unto the Spirit. As, as, we, as I was reading in Romans over in the 5th and the 6th chapter, it says, as you have yielded your members to unrighteousness, and you saw what the fruit of that was, it was death and destruction, nothing that we could boast in today, now yield your members to righteousness by the Spirit. Not the righteousness that comes of the, uh, of the law, which is of the outer commandment, but the, the righteousness that comes by the new nature that you've received by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, who's the one that can judge you on that? God alone. Because the external observer isn't going to know that you're not following it by an external voice. But you know, as Paul the Apostle did, and see, he had to write this to prove it. The, the, the book of Galatians was written to the naysayers, the ones that were saying he was a false apostle because they were trying to turn the, the Galatians, the people in Galatia, back towards the external code and say, yes, yes, you received Jesus as Lord, but you need to hold on to these things as well. Circumcision and all these other things, you need to also do those. In other words, you need to become a natural Jew. And they said, Paul the Apostle, he's a, he's a false apostle because he's teaching you that it's only by grace. So, Paul uses this scripture to set out that he's not only a true apostle, and he tries his best to stay humble without boasting, but he says um, that over in the first chapter, he says, I'm surprised in the sixth verse, and I'm, I'm reading out of the Amplified, and astonished that you are so quickly turning renegade and deserting him who invited and called you by the grace, the unmerited favor of Christ the Messiah, and that you are transferring your allegiance to a different, even an opposition gospel. Not that there is or could be any other genuine gospel, but there are obviously some who are troubling and disturbing and bewildering you with a different kind of teaching, which they, which they offer as a gospel. And it was just a mixture of both covenants. And want to pervert and distort the gospel of Christ, the Messiah, into something which it absolutely is not. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary and different from that which we preach to him, let him be accursed. Okay, I'm going to go on because he says that twice in a row, which means he's, he's really serious about that, that they need to, he's basically saying they need to bear the fruit of their deed. They're, they're sowing curse among you. Because if you go back to the law, after Jesus has been crucified and hung on a tree and became a curse, you're crucifying to yourself the Lord afresh. And that is going to do nothing but work a curse into your life. That's the reality of it. Because guess what? If you reap or if you sow to the flesh, what are you going to reap? Destruction. Destruction. Guys, the, the first covenant is unto the flesh. There is it. We're only going to walk in one or the other. If you're under the law, you're going to reap all that that happens as a result of the law. And it's corruption and it's destruction. And all the blessing people take pride in, and then when they miss the mark, it's condemnation. There's only those two wide spans. The Lord comes right in the middle of them. Yeah. Praise God. Right in the middle of the, of the word of grace, of the word of faith, the Lord takes the high places and brings them down, and the low places and brings them up, and He appears in the midst of that order of the new law of the Spirit, praise God, where no person can judge Him according to the flesh. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. What a change. What a difference. Amen. 
Amen. And he says, he said in, uh, let me go down. I like 11. For I want you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was proclaimed and made known by me is not man's gospel, a human invention, according to or pattern after any human standard. For indeed, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. It came to me through a direct revelation given by Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And you have heard of my earlier career and former manner of life in the Jewish religion, Judaism, how I persecuted and abused the church of God furiously and extensively. And with fanatical zeal, there it is, did my best to make havoc of it and destroy it. And have heard how I outstripped many of the men of my own generation among the people of my race in my advancement in study and in observance of the laws of Judaism. So extremely enthusiastic and zealous I was for the traditions of my ancestors. But when he who had chosen me and set me apart, even before I was born, praise God, and had called me by his grace, his undeserved favor and blessing, saw fit and was pleased to reveal, unveil, disclose his son within me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. He says, immediately I did not confer with flesh and blood. I did not consult or counsel with any frail human being or communicate with any anyone. Nor did I even go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles, special messengers of Christ before I was. But I went and retired into Arabia, and afterwards I went again to Damascus. Then three years later I did go up to Jerusalem to become personally acquainted with Cephas, Peter, and remained with him for fifteen days. But I did not see any of the other apostles, the special messengers, except James, the brother of our Lord. Now, note carefully what I am telling you, for it is the truth. I write it as if I were standing before the bar of God. I do not lie. Then I went into the districts of Syria and Cilicia, and so far as I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Christ in Judea, they they were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now proclaiming the very faith he once reviled, and which he set out to ruin and tried to destroy. And they glorified God as the author and source of what had taken place. And then after an interval, an interval of 14 years, I again went up to Jerusalem. This time I went with Barnabas, taking Titus also along with me. I went because it was specially and divinely revealed to me that I should go. And I put before them the gospel, which I preached among the Gentiles. However, privately before those of repute, for I wanted to make certain by thus at the first confining my communication to this private conference that I was not running or had run in vain, guarding against being discredited, either in what I was planning to do or had already done. But all went well, even Titus, who was with we, with me, was not compelled, as some had anticipated, to be circumcised, although he was a Greek. My precaution was, because of some men who were Christians in name only, false brethren, who had secretly, smugly, stepped in or slipped in to spy on our liberty and the freedom which we had in Christ Jesus, that they might again bring us into bondage. And that's under the law of Moses. To them we did not yield submission even for a moment that the truth of the gospel might be might continue to be preserved for you in its purity now that's that's really the key here in its purity no mixture not mix, mixing men's doctrines or 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 ways with the pure way of the spirit and he goes on and and basically says i'm not going to continue to read you can read it there if you want but he basically said they had nothing to add to what i had received in the spirit Nothing. Uh, in other words, everything that they had received by walking with Jesus for three and a half years, by seeing all the miracles that he had done, all of the way of his life, everything that they had received after the flesh, Paul, the apostle, a man born out of due season, received that same, that same life of Jesus by revelation, by the Spirit. And he didn't have anybody teach it to him, but the Spirit taught it. Praise God. Now that is the purity of the new covenant. Now, On the other hand, he was balanced in this regard. He recognized that these were true apostles and that God had appointed them as pillars, he called them, in God's house. So he didn't discredit that and say, I'm a loner, I can go it alone. He went to his church, he went to his body, and he said, now let's examine this and make sure this is true, both for himself and for them. Hallelujah. And for the people that were hearing. So that he knew he could have that witness in the wor- in the wi- uh, mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established so that we know. We're, we're, not, we're not shooting from the hip here. We're not saying we need to just go it alone or, or you know, separate ourselves and become just islands. No. That, that's why we thank God even for uh, the ministry that we have 
on Facebook and YouTube and these things, Amen. when we're separated and, and we need a witness by the Spirit, it's available for us, yep. okay? We don't do away with local assemblies and gatherings. We don't do away with any of these things. But we recognize who the true teacher is yep. in this. It is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that leads us and guides us into all truth. And it requires something more of us. What we're talking about is that that, that intimate prayer life. We, we, we have no other way, folks. In this day and age, when there's so much information, when there is so much, so many voices, so many doctrines, you know, so many uh, things pulling at us, pulling for our attention, pulling for our allegiance, right? There is a way that seems right into men, and the way thereof is the ways of death. What is that way? It's the old way. Okay, but we haven't been called unto to go back to Egypt or to go back to the old way. We've been called unto a new and living way yeah. whereby we've been consecrated. Hallelujah. We've been set apart by and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been washed by the water of the word yeah. and we've been sanctified. We've been uh, we've been glorified. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Not for our own self-glorification, but to bring glory unto the Lord who lives in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Him we live and move and have our being. And what I love about these things is it stirs me up to purpose. See? We, we, we are not, uh, we're not to be purposeless in our walk. If we get, it, that, that's where, you know, we can get too far on either side. We can get where we're just so concerned that nothing's gotten done. And we're just struggling to do something to make it happen. Well, we're unbalanced in that respect. On the other hand, if we look back and say, it was all done. I don't have to do anything but just sit still and see the salvation of God. That, there's truth in both of those. Truly, there is. But the reality is, is in this message of the grace of the Lord, it doesn't take away from the fact that God has made us co-workers yeah. together with Christ. I was going to go to that scripture, but over there in Ephesians, the second chapter, after he talks about it's by grace that we've been saved, he says, but you've been recreated in Christ Jesus unto good, good works. Work. He's before ordained that yeah. we should walk in. Them. Amen. And then Peter in his epistle says, by these precious promises, which come by faith. It's all, if you look at the covenants, the first covenant really, truly by spirit was unto Abraham and it was the promise. But the last will be made first. <laughs> So that which we receive according to our natural na nature really is f the first covenant. You come out and you're, you're trained as a child and you're under tutors and governors, aren't you? Right? We can teach a child all about the grace and the love and the spirit of the Lord, but I find out it's the rod <laughs> that drives out the spirit. And all those, I go back and read Solomon and the Proverbs. See, if we're, if we're unbalanced, guys, people take their scripture and they throw half of it out the window because they become one-sided. See, I like that. The subjective side and the objective side. Or the objective side. And this, you, you take that which is finished and then you begin to walk in it. Praise God. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. And that's what I was going to say. Peter in his epistle said, it's by these precious promises that we have been made partakers of His divine, divine nature. nature. That nature isn't inactive. It's very active. Our God is as a river, as the wind. He is moving. We need to get into the flow. Praise God. Yes. We need to have active faith. Doesn't mean we're going to be born out of just zeal trying to do something just to get something done. We, it's all in this position of balance. We wait upon the Lord, but when He moves, we move. We don't let our feet get in concrete where when He's moving, you can't move because you're paralyzed. A lot of times it's because of unbelief or apathy. Those things, you know what apathy is. It's where you become very comfortable and you just go, eh, it doesn't really matter. It's all going to get done one way or another. You know, that's why people have taken the glorious gospel of the reconciliation and the salvation of the world and thrown it out the window. Because there's been those that have said, well, if it's all going to be salvation in the end, what do I need to preach for? What do we need to teach for? What do we need to witness for? And I would say to those beloved brother, because that's the very avenue how he's going to save the world. It won't get done except we share the gospel of the good news. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we thank God for what he's doing. Glorious grace, glorious mercy. And yet he's given us a purpose. He's given us a place to partake in the glories of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he sure does make us humble so that we wait on him so that we don't go in our own strength. But it's, I, I feel like it's always, it's always, we're always in a season one way or another of some kind of correction. <laughs> yeah. When we run ahead too far, the Lord pulls us back by circumstances or his voice. And when we 
S delay? <laughs> he brings us on. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah.